I ask my brother here to share briefly in community and how did you get to know about our community? For those to Human Life International. Let's start with my story. Now you know why we have the whole day. <laughs> I joined the community in 1995. So that's just the beginning. At the invitation of my wife, who was then a handmaid, and my four-year-old daughter who was in Kids for Christ then, sisters and brother-in-laws, and one of them is sitting right there. Getting me into the uh, into community for me is actually a family effort. I thank God for them because being in this community is one of the best things I have done in my life. I think it. Brother Barber, we'll start from my far right, and then as we pass the microphone, and we go all the way to the left. Morning, brothers. Morning. I joined the community in 1994 back in the Philippines when uh, one of my ex that are, was a girl <laughs> called me up, you know, uh, so I eventually attended on the third week. But uh, that was really, I think, uh, you know, uh, the time, the perfect time and uh, the perfect place because I didn't know my future wife was also in the same uh, seminar. So uh, we uh, became, uh, of course, boyfriend, girlfriend, 1994, I mean, 1996, and then 2000, we became uh, Couples for Christ. Uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, I joined the, the community in 2002 when I was 20 years old, okay? Oh. <laughs> so um, it, it was uh, a very difficult decision um, because I was part of the choir and one of our choir members, he, he just migrated, you know, from the Philippines. And you know what? He's a member of CFC in the Philippines. Guarding on me. So from work, you know, before I even park my car, you know, in front of my house, he's already waiting for me <laughs> to bring me to the CLP, CLP during that time. So uh, with that kind <laughs> and I, I completed, you know, the, the CLP program uh, with the grace of God. Thank you. I joined the uh, community in 1997 upon the uh, invitation of my uh, younger brother, Jim, and my <laughs> sister-in-law, Vivian. And, uh, they invited us to attend the, uh, to attend the, uh, the prayer assemblies, the uh, general prayer assemblies. And with, uh, that was back in 1997. So we've, we did the uh, 13 talks, uh, Christian Life program. And we, I guess we didn't miss any of the, the talks. And at the time, I was uh, uh, only married for five years, and it was a good opportunity for us to bring our family into the community. Good morning. Good morning. So um, my wife and I joined the community back in uh, 1998. this uh, daughter she just slipped out of our hands because we were in the parish and then she started playing outside just you know nearby the entrance and then another four-year-old joined, joined her playing 
And then both moms, you know, my wife and another um, sister came together. Invited us immediately on that day, and then we said yes. Yeah, we completed the 13 talk. Since 1997, when I uh, took up the CLP in uh, Immaculate Conception Parish in South Plainfield in New Jersey, I was invited by my brother, who is a servant leader in the Philippines of CFC then, and when he came over in the U.S., there were uh, seven of our siblings, five of them. And uh, he was the only one who joined an organization or a ministry like CFC. And he mandated four of us who were just uh, whiling our time uh, doing uh, silly little things then. And uh, he mandated us to take up the CLP. It was the greatest thing that happened to me then. Now I am 24 years in this community and I have no regrets whatsoever. And I even encourage my children, I have five boys, to join in. And uh, they are fine for the year ends. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, I first started working for Human Life International in uh, 1986. And uh, since that time, my favorite country is the Philippines. I went there the first time in 1995. I've been back uh, 16 times. Uh, my boss, Father Bouquet of Human Life International, the president, has been there about as many times and uh, we always say that we look forward to going back to the Philippines. Because of this virus, we miss it very much. But the second best thing, if we can't go to the Philippines, we can bring the Philippines here to us and come to be with you. And uh, just as real quickly here, I have found the Filipinos to be the yeast of the faith, as I call them, all over the world. Wherever the Filipinos go, the faith rises. And this is what we depend upon at Human Life International. In our audience, you have heard about our individual call, our personal circumstances, and how we got into our community. But that's just a very short story. We don't encounter struggles, trials, and hardships. You will begin to wonder, Am I really living an authentic Christian life? Meaning, as much as we dislike, avoid, or even hate these difficulties and trials, we cannot honestly believe that we can make it to heaven without them. Brothers, probably just like you, I try to avoid or even am scared to accept the fact the trials are indeed part of my faith journey up to the very end of our life. I remember my wife when uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey of 2012, just right before the November election. She shared me this um, kind of scary dream. In, in our faith journey, she's always the one who's being, you know, being on a, what you call this, revelational kind of gift. I'm more on the thinking kind of uh, gift. Um, but she was shown this kind of uh, dream that there was a big earthquake, a pounding earthquake. And then it was, the ground was pounded seven times. Seven great 
pounding from that earthquake. And then after that, the, the dust settles down, there is a trinket and there is a something inside and the hand took it and gave it to her. And she shared me that story and I was scared. I was like, you know, how long will seven gonna last for us to be able to get that uh, whatever purification we need to go through. So however, my personal life, my family life, and all aspects of my life indeed have all the marking of little and big crosses here and there. When we enter the community, just like what I said in 1998, it feels like heaven. Everything has changed for the better, brothers. Something inside has transformed. I would say instantly. For some of us, that's probably not the case. Our views of life, the purpose of created things, and eternity itself has become so real. Our newfound life is indescribable that it becomes a passion for us to really share this good news. But on that same year, just a couple of months later, we had to fly to the to the United States. So June, we were dedicated, 1998. And then September, we have to pack up and fly here due to the Y2K boomers. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> For some of you who've been part of that, yeah, that's the time that, you know, our lives changed just in the wink of an eye. We reconnect, reconnected immediately with CFC community in New Jersey, where we landed. But from there, we found ourselves in an uncharted territory. Suddenly, it was like a roller coaster ride. Times of joyful, exhilarating mountain peak and times of dark, agonizing valley. Brothers, looking back, there are three things in my life of service that I have learned. First, serving God is not without trials. All of us agree to that. Second, misfortunes and humiliation help to purify me, reveal my weakness and sin. Third, that unwavering trust in God always are rewarded with bigger blessings. Every time we have a big event, most often than not, there will be an attack that is about to happen. I don't want even to think about any service if it's going to be given to me. <laughs> Mostly before the event, but sometimes after the event. Whether it's a mission trip, evangelization, area-wide weekend retreats, praise fest, praying outside the abortion clinics, this conference, you know, even big celebrations, just community anniversaries, there will be some form, form of harassment, and some of them are really, really painful. Unlike St. Paul, though, I have not been imprisoned, not been flogged, received lashes, but for us, these are just some of the trials that we've experienced. First, during one winter, winter storm in New Jersey, I was about to give a talk for our pro-life weekend. And when our, on our way, we spun out of control three times, 360, three, 360 degrees, three times, while on a highway, and an icy highway. Second, Rhoda was rushed a couple of times to emergency room due to her asthma attack just before going to conference. My father-in-law passed away before I gave a talk in Burbank, California, that my wife had to rush booking a flight to Manila. Our home was randomly vandalized while we were out doing evangelization. My three-year-old daughter fell on the stairs having a service meeting. It was a bloody one. <laughs> I've lost my job twice, one in 2001 after 9-11 and one in 2008, that fin financial crisis, while my wife was pregnant on both of those two occasions. And just recently, brothers, during previous winter storm here in, in Texas, our whole family, except for my son who's not staying with us, my wife and our five daughters succumbed to COVID-19 back in late February to March, just when this conference preparation is about to take off. First thing we said to God, Lord, this is another big storm, and this one is different and scary. We prayed as a family and kept pleading 
him to help us go through this without any untoward incident. You know, when you got a flu just for one week with serious symptoms, right? You already felt worn out. In my battle against COVID, though, it was a three week ordeal for me. With the second week, feeling like I'm passing through purgatory, dreading each night that comes for it was when the, the agony is at its peak. I couldn't sleep the entire night and would only pass out around 6 a.m. in the morning when my body was already too tired of coughing. With those different symptoms, high fever, hard coughing, stomach pains, body ache, headache, hardness of breathing, some hallucinations for Sister Roda, <laughs> and not able to take care of our children and one another were so devastating. All of us were worried for Roda due to her pre-existing condition, which is asthma, with her oxygen level going down. That's when, for the first time in forever, my wife and I entertained the possibility of passing from this earthly life. The pain and suffering were so tremendous that we might have experienced the best surrendered prayer we could have uttered in our lives. We were like, Lord, this could be it. Please take care of our children. One night during one of the worst attacks, I left the bedroom and saw my wife in the dark living room, barely moving so as not to strain her breathing. Together is a sign of let go, just in case either one of us or both won't make it. Rhoda told me that, that at that darkest moment, she saw a light coming out of the big crucifix from the altar, and it gave her hope and assurance that God will never abandon us. He is with us all the time while we were inside the storm. He just has to trust in him. And as more days passed by, brothers, some of our children started recovering, which affirms God's message of not abandoning us. That light coming off from that altar was his grace that worked through the diligent care of our doctor, avoiding a trip to emergency room, all the words and prayers of encouragement from different people, and lavish and supply of food, groceries, vitamins, appearing in front of our door for three consecutive weeks from our brothers and sisters here in this uh, city of Houston. This fact is true for all the other trials that we went through in the past, that the light of God is bigger than our darkness. And for that, be truly be praised forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Melvin, for sharing that inspiring story. It is really, truly inspiring. It's not because of all the sufferings, but God never abandoned Brother Melvin. And if we truly believe, and if we really have faith, we can move mountains, brothers and sisters. Uh, I was really moved. Indeed, when God called us to serve, He did not say it would be easy. In fact, he said to carry our cross and follow him. He didn't say, just follow me. And everything will be in a silver platter or you will be always riding in a Mercedes Benz. No, it's not that way, brothers. But brothers, truly our God is a faithful God. He called us and he equipped us. If we are patient and if we put our trust in him, he promised that he will always be there for us. To guide us and to help us all the way. It's like Brother Melvin and his family. He will not only help us but reward us as well. If not in this life, then in the next. 
Amen? Amen. Now let us take a look of some experience of the early church and see how our church fathers, the apostles and first disciples, the very, the very first followers of our Lord Jesus Christ encountered and lived out the teaching in Sirach chapter 2. Our brother Butchablos will do this for us. Okay, so uh, we all know we all know that the uh, Pentecost is the beginning of the uh, one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So the apostles were gathered in the room, the disciples were gathered in the room, and then all of a sudden there was a loud that broke down like uh, tanks of fire that settled on each of the believers. Uh, and after this, uh, they were bold to proclaim the teachings, the ministry of Jesus. And if we are familiar with our Christian Life Seminar, this is where it's all based. On that day, when they were able to convert 3,000 3, uh, believers. So it started with uh, Jesus the Messiah, Call to witness, repentance and faith, gifts of the Spirit, and growing in the Spirit. And that's what we believe. That once we are able to live out uh, Christ in us, we're able to touch others as well because they see us as the walking, walking Bible, our life. And believers grew in numbers. The devil is also on the attack. So the attack not only comes from outside, but there are also enemies within the, uh, within the starting church. And if we look at the church today, we can say that even now, there are enemies within the church. So the early church was growing rapidly. And it's not surprising, like I said, that the devil will be attacking it. And let's take a look at the example of the two uh, apostles. Uh, Peter and John. So when we look at the, uh, uh, the story of Peter and John, uh, we look at the ministry of Jesus. Jesus healed a man um, with a withered hand on the day of Sabbath. And because of that, uh, they persecuted him because he was not supposed to be healing on, on Sabbath. And what did uh, Peter and John do? Two is uh, they, or did is they healed a a man with uh, who was lame from birth, and again they were uh, accused of uh, disturbing the peace. Because what was happening was when they healed, of course people would want to to see what was happening. Somebody who has been lame for his birth and all of a sudden started to walk, and they were not only healing, but they were also preaching. The word of God, the ministry of Jesus. And what is the ministry of Jesus? He talks about peace. And right now in this world, if you talk about peace, then people don't want to hear that. They want to live in the darkness. They want to be in the, in the comforts of what they are doing. So whatever you challenge them, they don't want to hear. But God's word comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. And it's even for us. Sometimes it, whatever truth that we hear, we know that it's true. We want to kill the messenger. Killing the messenger doesn't change the truth. And that's what was before. So like I said, even within the church, there was also strife. So we look at the, uh, they shared their time when they were gathering uh, to, to, to worship. And they were sharing the talents, the teachings of the, uh, the disciples. And they also shared their treasures. One of the uh, believers, Barnabas, whose name translates into son of uh, encouragement, he sold his property and gave all his, uh, all, all what he sold to the apostles. And there was a wife and husband, husband and wife, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who also sold their property. But they took some of the money aside to keep for themselves. 
and gave it to the gave the remaining to the apostles. And so when uh, Peter asked asked uh, Ananias, "Is this all the money that you received from the sale of your property?" And he said, "Yes." And Peter said, "Why did you let the devil get into your? You not only lied to man." But you are lying to the Holy Spirit. You are lying to God. And when he heard this, he fell and died. And three hours later, uh, Sapphira came in. She didn't know what happened to her husband. And so again, Peter asked her, Is this all the money that you uh, sold from your property? And she said, Yes. Yeah. And Peter said, The food of the man that buried your husband is not even cold. And you lied to the to the Holy Spirit, and she also died. So, is it the sin of not being generous? It's it's not. It is the sin of deceit. It's the sin of lying. And so, Peter asked them, "The property was yours even before you sold it, and it's still yours after you sold it." But look at the the teachings or uh, teachings about that uh, that. Uh, that story it is like us when we say lord i'm yours but we're not giving the hundred percent we're being against god that lord i'll keep that ten percent and i'll know or i'll keep the i'll keep this percentage and i know what to do with this so it's not a hundred percent of giving to god and one of the uh, uh apostles as well was uh stephen so we know the uh, of uh, stephen from last night and he was in front of the uh, priest and the and the teachers and he reminded them from the story of abraham to moses to the different prophets and he told them that all these people you did not believe even the prophets from before you did not believe and you killed them and even jesus christ who came the son of god and what did you do you killed him and so this is the truth they do they took him outside to be stoned to death and jesus when jesus was on the cross his message was father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing and when stephen was uh, being stoned his message was lord do not take this against them what was happening right now that he's being stoned but he was beyond that when he was dying, he saw the heavens open up and Jesus at the right hand of the Father. So with our struggle, we don't look at what's happening right now. Let's look beyond the struggle. Because God is, it, is it at the end of that struggle. And when Jesus was crucified, the centurion was also looking at what was happening. And when he died, he said, truly, this is the Son of God. So when he saw Jesus died, he was converted. And who was present during the stoning of Stephen? It was Saul. Right? He was watching the stoning of Stephen. But in the end, he also was converted. He became Saint Paul. And what happened to Saint Paul? He was also stoned close to death. And what did he do? He actually continued the ministry of uh of uh saint or stephen and so the people that persecuted him actually continued the work of the the ministry and stephen is considered one of the uh, seven deacons so if you look at his image you can see that his image represents a stone on his head a stone on your on the shoulder and so these are all the trials uh of the early or some of the trials of the early believers so here's a short uh, video that we want to watch and we'll see how much more uh, trials the other believers also believe so uh, let's play the uh, video um yeah so going back with the story of saint paul he was converted as well Well, the building was never proven, 
virtually every significant historian blames the fire on Nero himself. No doubt because of what Nero decided to do afterward. He immediately commandeered huge torches to throw the scorched earth to erect one of the biggest, most popular palaces in all the known world. It's known as the Domus Aurea, or the Golden House. Nero was also shrewd enough to accuse a scapegoat for the fire to appease the general Roman public. The culprits of choice, the Christians, and blaming them sparked the first great outbreak of state-sponsored persecution that lasted for several years. The Christians were already somewhat of a nuisance, accused of cannibalism because they consumed the Lord's Supper, which commemorated the sacrificial body and blood of Jesus. And atheists because they refused to bow to the Roman gods. So, oh. so they were the perfect target. Atheist, not Christian Roman historian, alive at the time, named Tacitus, mentions the persecution in his hand. This is what he wrote. You're the first to be accused. Those people call Christians. Those people call Christians. Those people call Christians. The originator of the Lady Christ was executed as a criminal by the procurator Pontius Pilate due to the reign of Tiberius. And though repressed, this destructive superstition erupted again, not only through Judea, the foreign kings in Rome, but also through the city of Rome. First, the world was seen to admit it early, and then, using the information they provided, a vast multitude were convicted, not so much for the crime of burning the city but for hatred of the human race. And as usual, they were initially made into swords. They were killed by dogs by having the hinds of beasts attached to them, or they were nailed to crosses or to set aflame. And when the daylight passed away, they were removed as night kind of acts. Even though they were clearly guilty, people began to pity these sufferers because they were consumed not for the public good, but on account of the fierceness of one man. One such martyr who was killed by crucifixion was a prominent apostle named Peter, who had become the head of the church in Rome. Considering himself to be unworthy to experience the same death as Jesus, Peter requested to be crucified upside down. Another apostle, one of Christianity's most influential because he wrote almost half of the New Testament, Paul, was also martyred during Nero's persecution. But since Paul was a Roman citizen, he was exempt from the torture of crucifixion and was beheaded instead. Nero's persecution, while bloody and unspeakably cruel, quite simply backfired. Not only was there growing sympathy for the suffering Christians, their worldview and beliefs were brought into the limelight. Countless Romans witnessed these believers endure ghastly tortures rather than recant their faith in Christ as Lord his resurrection from the dead. Christian tradition holds that, except for John, all of Jesus' apostles were executed for their faith. For many Christians, this is a strong argument for the truth of their claims. The apostles, because they were eyewitnesses, knew for certain whether Jesus' resurrection was true or false. This set them apart. History is full of people willing to die for what they believe, but it's difficult to find same persons who will give their life for a cause they know to be fraudulent. Those who defend the Christian faith ask this question. How likely was it that a man would choose torture and death if all he had to do was simply deny a myth? So the growth of this great world of religion was fueled by the blood of its all because of a fire at a race time. And Nero, after hearing of an assassination plot, committed suicide by stabbing himself in the throat. His legacy then drifted into history, and even today he is considered to be one of Rome's worst seizures. Okay, so brother, obviously I haven't been beheaded. I haven't been crucified set on fire, fed to the lions, fed to the dogs, or, 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 or tortured, right? Each of one of us experienced our own persecution. When I was appointed a unit servant, I asked a brother for advice, and this is the advice he gave me. 
pray for the position, and if God doesn't want you there, He will make a way to take you out. And so I still live on, on that advice. I am in a position because God desires me to be in that position. When I was appointed a chapter servant, I didn't ask any brother for any advice. At that time, I've been going to a chapel uh, during my lunch hour or during my fasting days. I would go to a chapel, and I will let you guess the name of the, cha of the church. It is St. Paul's Catholic Church. And in that uh, chapel on the right left side of the, uh, the altar, there's an image of Saul when he was blinded by the light. And on the right side of the chapel is the image of Paul leading the community of believers. So whenever I'm there uh, reading my talks, if I have any talks, that's, that's where I would go in front of the blessed sacrament. I would review my talk. And I remembered my, my prayer then. Lord, I want to be like St. Paul. I want to lead others to Christ. And I think, I guess we have to be careful with what we, <laughs> what, what you pray for, right? And so, after I accepted the, uh, the chapter servant position, a brother called me and said, Brother Boots, if they offer you the position of chapter servant, do not accept it. And I said, why? Because your children are still small. So it was a good intention. My kids were only seven and a half and six years old. But at the time, after I hanged up the phone and thanked him, I didn't even consider my family when I made the decision to accept the chapter servant. I didn't even know how I'm going to speak in front of the community on how I'm going to lead. But really all I wanted to do was to lead the community. And with that as well, uh, in the community, there's uh, all of us are, I guess, are emotional about our community. We want, we want this, right? We, we want to be part of it. And during our crisis in 2007, emotions were high. We know what happened then, right? Some people wanted to stay, some people want to move on, and some, some people wanted to go in different directions. So it is good because we are all involved in this community. In one of the uh, events, in one of the gatherings, uh, of course, like I said, people were, emotions were high, and I was there, and they confronted me about my decision. And a brother even uh, came to me and said, Brother Booth, if I have my ID with me, I will tear it in your face. And so I was there and just, I was just listening. And uh, a few days after, somebody uh, told me of how the event was described. How, how did it go with Brother Boots? And the response I received or the, the message I got was, they devoured him. So a few days later, I know they had a meeting. And so they were meeting and I, I guess it, it's good, right? That, that you are involved in this. And after the meeting, a brother called me and said, Brother Boots, the church made the decision. We decided to stay with the community. At that, I couldn't say anything. I just cried on the phone. And the brother also started crying. And he said, Brother Boots, we're driving to your home right now. So him and his wife came over to our place. And it was a very emotional evening. And at that time, the sister said, Brother Boots, we are the sheep. You are the shepherd. We follow where the shepherd leads us. The sheep doesn't tell the shepherd, hey, shepherd, take us over there. Hey, shepherd, take us on the other direction. And whenever we pray in the evening, the last mystery is always dedicated to our community. We always lift the leaders of our community that they will be guided to lead us. And so I'm hoping that all of us are praying for the leaders above us, that they are our shepherd, that they will lead us into, uh, in, uh, into the right direction. Pope St. John Paul II said, our prayer should be great, intense, and growing. If you look at the life of the early disciples, the early believers, 
That's what it is. Their life is intense. Their faith is intense, great, and growing. How else can they only focus on Christ and not themselves? They are focused on nothing else. And that's why they're able to die for their belief. And so that's my desire as well, that I will leave my faith no matter what, what comes to us. And so it is a, a challenge for, for me and for us to live through, the, through this persecution. We see that Peter that watched the crucifixion of Christ was converted. Saul who watched the stoning of Stephen was converted. And so whenever we feel persecution, we pray for the people that persecute us, that, that persecutes us, that we also be transformed and used by God. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Boots, for sharing your moving personal experience. Holy Warriors! Whoa! I think it doesn't work right. Uh, do you agree with me, Brother Melvin? Uh, the second one, how about the third one? It's... Holy Warriors! There you go. I guess you still want to be a holy warrior in spite of all the sharings that you already heard. Good. We need each one of you. When we serve the Lord, persecution comes with the territory. We are all aware of that. Are we? Only three. You better be aware. And experience it. Have you experienced it? The only three again. Or one way or the other. Nobody. Where is Father Celsius? Am I talking to the Catholics here? Yeah. Or Catholic. The enemy is not sleeping, brothers. He is always waiting for the right time to weaken our resolve, to discourage us. Remember that everything, something happened, somebody's doing something to stop you. The bottom line is we never give up, never lose hope. For in Jesus, we will triumph. Amen? Amen? Oh, you're awake now. Brothers, we all recognize that the church, the body of Christ, includes all of us. Therefore, you and I, all of us here are the church. We are the body of Christ. Do you agree on that? Yes. Come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> do you agree on that? Yes. There you go. That's, that's better. I don't want you to be sleeping. At this point, let me call on Dr. Brown. Us, uh, to reflect on the current church persecution. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be with you. And one thing that I've always noticed that the Filipinos always take care of you. And uh, I got this uh, this name card here says Father Brian Close. So, <laughs> so apparently I've been promoted. I told my wife at home I'll hear her confession. <laughs> Have any of you men here who are married ever had your wife say to you, 
I'm going to confession. What do you think I should confess? Has that ever happened? <laughs> I always reply to that, oh, you want to fight today, huh? <laughs> well, I'd like to tell you my story, my travels in the faith. I was not born Catholic. In fact, uh, my road to the Catholic faith has been a very long one, more than 200 years, as a matter of fact. And it begins with a volcano erupting in Indonesia in 1816. If not for that volcano in, uh, that was erupting in Indonesia more than 200 years ago, I would not be sitting here today. So how is it connected? Sometimes you see, you can't understand God's plan its entirety. We just don't have the brain power. But sometimes you can see one of the threads. And this is a very interesting one because when that Mount Tambora erupted halfway around the world in 1816, it caused a large amount of debris to be thrown up into the air. And what happened is it cooled off the entire earth. And in North America, that year was called the year without a summer because the sweet grass died. And this meant that almost all of the horses died as well. And so people didn't have a way to get around. So what did they do? Two men got together and invented the bicycle, the first bicycle. And what does that have to do with me being here today? Because in 1967, when we were both 15 years old, my wife came over to my house, my future wife came over to my house to ask if she could borrow my bicycle. <laughs> and I looked through the screen door and I said, this girl is so beautiful. I, I really have to get to know her. She had very long, dark hair. She had very brown eyes, just very beautiful smile, very, very beautiful girl. And so we started dating, went to ride bicycles also together, which is very nice. But um, we've been together now for 47 years, married. <laughs> when people ask me how long we've been married, I like to say, we've been happily married for 21 years. The other 26, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened there was I grew up in a rather uh, well-to-do family, very, very uh, distinguished family. My father was a Broadway actor and a high-ranking army officer, and my mother was uh, one of the lead ballerinas in the London uh, uh, Ballet Company. As this went on, of course, my father climbed up in the ranks, and I had everything I needed, and uh, I didn't understand how to relate to anybody else. When I met she came from a very poor family of 10 children, and her father worked very hard to support this family. And what I noticed about this poor family is everybody was happy. My relatives were not happy. They were always <laughs> trying to achieve something else, trying to get more things. You know what I mean? And I said, what's the difference here? And so, even though they never preached the faith to me, this family of 12 people taught the faith to me. The faith is not taught, it's caught. And in my case, I caught it bad and became Catholic when I was 22 years old. We had some interesting discussions, my future wife and I, because I was, I'd heard all of this stuff about overpopulation. We should only have one or two children. This was going back in the 1960s. And uh, I was saying to her, for the sake of the environment, because children are expensive, we should have one or two children. And she said, I think I'd like to have three or four. So we compromised and had seven. So, <laughs> <laughs> we started out with five boys and uh, my wife was pregnant again. And she said, I'm so tired of being in a barracks. I sure hope we do have a girl this time. And this is the second time I went to the Philippines in 1996 and I visited uh, in the, the great Santo Domingo Church in Manila. And you see that the beautiful statue, La Navala of Our Lady back there. And I said, please, blessed lady, if you'll give us a girl this time, we'll all come back and we'll visit you. And so certainly enough, a few months later, Rachel was born. And so we went back to visit. And my wife came with me. So Rachel is now coming up on her first anniversary. She was born on Humana Vitae Day, July the 25th, and she's very happy. I'm very grateful to God for all of our blessings. So in my story, 
I was born in a family that didn't have really any regard for God. We might go to church one time a week. Nobody ever spoke about God. And so whatever small amount of faith I had was one dimensional. God was over there and he am way over here. And I really didn't care about God or know how to reach him. But when I met my wife's family, then it began to become more two dimensional. And I began to realize that there's more to this than just ritual. These great mysteries of the Blessed Sacrament and the Holy Trinity, what is this all about? What are the teachings of the church all about? But only when I became involved in activism with my wife did the faith become three-dimensional. So I could see all three parts of it, you know. The faith really has applicability in the world today. And the world doesn't want to hear this message. The world does not want to hear it at all. And the world is going to fight back. And that's where the suffering begins. And when I read about the saints so many years ago, they took suffering, and I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Suffering hurts. You know, I don't like to suffer. Pain hurts. This is crazy stuff. But now I understand the joy in suffering. During my HLI travels, we've been in war zones and earthquakes. We've encountered Ebola Zai air, which will kill you in 24 hours by liquefying your organs on the inside. Fortunately, managed to escape from that. Uh, I've encountered a headhunter head village, and Father Bouquet and I have even visited the, uh, the uh, lepers on Molokai. There are a few still left. So we've seen all kinds of different suffering in the world today. And when we were in Hawaii, we were going over the top of the hill, a big lava field there, and I said, I want to get a souvenir. So I jumped out of the Jeep, and I went over, and I picked up a big black rock of lava. And our guide came over and says, put that down, put it down, it's cursed. I said, what are you talking about? She said that whenever somebody takes one of these rocks away, it seems like they always mail it back from the United <laughs> States or wherever. They said, my life has been destroyed ever since I pick up this rock, so please put it back, I'm cursed. And I said, lady, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So I have one big rock in my house and one big rock at home uh, and one big rock at work. and. Uh, my life hasn't been cursed. It just hasn't gotten any worse. So there's great joy in doing the Lord's work. And I want to give you some details here on how I got into the pro-life movement. In 1984, my wife and I were invited to join a little group called the Metro Pro-Life Council. But after a few months, we realized these people didn't really do anything other than meet monthly. You know, maybe put a little article in the newspaper once a year. So then a group called Advocates for Life Ministries, an evangelical group, started in Portland, Oregon. And we said, ah, oh, these people seem to be doing activities, good activities. They were out picketing. They were doing the rescue missions. So my wife and I went out and we did rescues and we were beaten up by the pro-abortion people and thrown in jail. We were uh, sued by the abortion clinics. And yet none of it did anything to us. You know, we, we didn't care. We just kept on doing what we were doing. Finally, one of the pro-abortion people said, what is it going to take to stop you people? And my wife and I said, well, you're going to have to kill us. But then we'll come <laughs> back and haunt you, so you better not do that. <laughs> but Advocates for Life Ministries started promoting this idea of justifiable use of force. It's all right to kill abortionists. And so for a short time, we dropped out of the pro-life movement. But then we heard about Human Life International in 1987 it started giving talks for them and started working for them. And then I met this marvelous priest named Father Paul Mark, the founder of Human Life International in 1994. And he said, you have to come work for me in his typical German way. And so my wife and I talked about it. I said, well, I have to give up my retirement because I work for the government, I have to quit my high paying job and go to work for a nonprofit organization. And finally, we said, we know what God wants us to do. We're going to go and move all the way across the country to Virginia, and we're going to work for Human Life International. It's been absolutely marvelous for the last 26, 27 years or so. We've seen all kinds of things. Human Life International has traveled 20 million miles around the world. I myself have been to 70 different countries, traveled more than 2 million miles with my wife. We meet all kinds of weather conditions. We see all kinds of very sad things. We've been to Calcutta. Uh, and we've been all over the world together. And uh, this is the most wonderful work on earth because not only do you save little unborn babies, but you get to preach about the Catholic faith. And just uh, in conclusion here, I want to tell you the three great pieces of wisdom that I've learned. 
Number one is that science and church teachings always align together. People say the church is anti-science. Well, then why are the Catholics who live the faith the most happy? The second piece of wisdom is that the National Survey of Family Growth, the biggest sociological study in the entire world, which has been studying American families for 50 years, shown scientifically that the three indicators of a happy person are they're religious, they're married, and they grew up in an intact family with a father and a mother. What does that sound like? That sounds like fundamental Catholic teachings. And so finally, it's always easier to live as a Catholic than it is not to live as a Catholic. People say, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard to live as a Catholic. But our Lord said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And so we see all over the world, most people have fallen to the wickedness and the snares of the devil, premarital sex, drugs, you know, all kinds of sexual liaisons, adultery, all of this, and it causes them to be unhappy. Our Lord wills that nobody be lost. Our Lord wants us to be happy with him in heaven. The second question in the Baltimore Catechism. And he wants us to be happy here too. So know that when you're preaching and teaching and giving an example of the Catholic faith, you are helping people not only be eternally happy, but happy in this world as well. And so in conclusion, I'd like to say, I'm so happy to be with you. It's always a recharge for me to be with the great Filipinos. It's always a great experience for me. My wife often comes with me and certainly our favorite people in the world are the Filipinos. And uh, I, I hope God blesses all of you abundantly and makes your face so what suffering comes your way, brings you not sadness, but joy of every kind. Thank you very much. Thank I'm hearing confessions now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Claus. I will not change your title for your powerful sharing. Uh, it is indeed heartbreaking what is going on in, with our church today. Uh, now more than ever, we should always be on our guard and be vigilant. Amen. Amen. Let us be con in constant prayer. This is our weapon. We need to pray at every opportunity. Let us put on the armor of God to fight the attack of the enemy, not only in our church, but also in our society. Let salvation, righteousness, truth, the word of God, faith, and peace rule our lives, our hearts, and our minds. We are now moving to the next segment of our session, here to give us a glimpse of the life of St. Paul, the evangelist, his brother Eric Formento. Uh, thank you, brother Tim. Uh, thank you so much, brothers and sisters. Uh, I do have a video uh, for St. Paul. Can you play it, please? Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so St. Paul, uh, he's um, an evangelist, a great evangelist, uh, one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Uh, he's an icon of dramatic conversion. Uh, he used to be Saul. You know, he's the great persecutor of Christians, early Christians. Um, then he had his conversion, and he became Paul, a true servant of our Lord a holy warrior, um, a model for a life sanctified. Um, when he was Saul, um, he lived a life short of God's design because he did not understand um, God's work through his people. And in our community, you know, in our personal lives, uh, sometimes we fall short of how our life and what are these um, things that we do uh, that we fall short of God's design so like like Saul uh, he was a uh, Pharisee so he was focused more on the laws and traditions 
So uh, it's legalistic. So it's like Kant, you know, they have to follow step by step the laws. And they forget. He, he forgot the, the most important part, which is grace and relationships. Um, second, uh, why we fall short of God's design is um, we, we focus on the doing and not on the being. We focus on the task, you know, the work, not on God himself, not on building our life in the presence of our Lord. So there's a huge distinction between these two. Focus on the task, the service, but not on the God of service. And the third one, we serve uh, because we, sometimes we, we serve because uh, we want to be recognized. It's not for the glorification of our Lord. And in our community, um, we are truly blessed you know, in our zone um, because we have brothers and sisters um, who are really passionate in doing all our formation courses. All this training, you know, we continue evangelization work. But in the midst of that, uh, you heard our brethren here saying, you know, we experience pain and suffering. We experience terrible pain. Uh, personally, in my case, um, two years ago, you know, my, my mother passed away. And uh, I was able to go home uh, to give my last respect because I was taking care of my daughter and her son. Uh, she has this life threatening depression, so I cannot leave her. And uh, in last January, you know, I was surprised when my brother in the Philippines called that my uh, older brother was only 63 years old, uh, no medical conditions, he suffered a fatal heart attack, January 2021. It happened that the night before and in the following day, I was to give a talk. I was asked a um, month before to give a talk. And I really prayed hard to God to, to allow me you know, to have a clear mind and give the talk. Um, very deep prayer, and um, I was able to deliver the talk, and I just offered it to the repose of my brother. So that's my, my, many things in the family. It's only you know the past two or three years all these things happened in my life. In our community, uh, there's so much suffering also in the pandemic. If you watch the video that uh, was presented yesterday, more I think about seventy percent of those who died came from our zone. So we have chapter servants in active service, powerful chapter servant. He died early this year because of COVID-19. And I know we have a chapter and each member, almost each member had serious life-threatening medical condition. And so, um, it is hard. You no, know, I'll be hypocrite if I say, that's fine, you know, we will move on. You no, know, we were, I was hurt with the passing of my mom and my brother and our brethren in the community. It took, it took me several days, weeks and months, Really, to, to be myself. Lord, we're doing your work. But why are you doing this to me and the community? And I saw, remember the Sirach that was read earlier? Uh, so it takes a community, you embrace one another, and we're really blessed because of 
the structure, uh, the many trainings that we have, is a built-in uh, component that we do all this training, formation training, seminars, it strengthens us, unified us, make us stronger when we do the work of our Lord. And I'm grateful to our brothers that we persisted in doing all these things. And looking back, praise God that despite all these sufferings, pain, uh, we were able to open, establish our presence in all our assigned mission states. So we opened a new mail about three years ago. We opened the presence of our community in Hawaii uh, two years ago. Uh, we, we opened our presence in Utah last month. Okay. And in Colorado, we praise God that, you know, we have a brethren here from Texas, you know, he moved to Colorado. And he's now the area coordinator, you know, for Colorado. Praise God. <laughs> so God is really true. He's really true because um, he wants us to evangelize despite all these uh, setbacks in our life. He wants us to, to be the light to the world. But there's this challenge that we have to be persistent. We have to do what it takes to undergo this transformation in our heart, in our household meetings, you know, the assemblies. Because without this, it's hard. We need, that, we need to anchor ourselves in Him by doing this training. So um, before I end, so I have you know, five minutes. So I just want to share you a beautiful thing that happened to us in, um, in our Hispanic community. So before the pandem pandemic, um, we were so discouraged because uh, we, we did a, uh, a CLS in, um, in, in one of our big chapters in Sacramento about five years ago. And the top leaders, uh, he, he said, um, you know, he will be undergoing this diaconate program. So he kind of stepped you know, from the leadership role. And the wife had threatening medical conditions. So um, it's really hard because we don't speak the Spanish, right? So we cannot engage, you know, the members. Um, so we, you know, we can pray, you know, we continue to embrace you know, our Hispanic brothers. And uh, God is really good because uh, in, in the background, um, one of the brethren who graduated in the CLS five years ago, he was in our area, I live in Fairfield in our parish, and standing in the garden. And he has all these books and materials, you know, the, the Matrimonial Family Crystal before is now FMC. And the, the associate, the Hispanic priest said, uh, what, what is your ministry? Oh, I'm a member of this family, missionary families of Christ. But can you tell me about this, these ministries? He talked and the priest said, what a wonderful community. I want to learn more. So you know what happened? Uh, story short, uh, the priest, after Sunday mass, he gathered nine couples, leaders in the community, and he began training them. During the household meeting, doing the formation courses. They finished you know, the, the materials that we gave him. See, a huge binder. And then our brother came to us, Brother Eric, no, our least brother Ed. Uh, they want to do CLS in March 1st. There was already a, a virus, but we were able to do the in-person CLS. And lo and behold, with the grace of God, uh, through the help of our Filipino brethren uh, in Fairfield, uh, we did the uh, impossible, okay? Uh, we got graded 426 Hispanic CLS. So it's a, a full chapter. Full chapter, yeah, 426. So 
So now we're trying to build, you know, build the training and, you know, it's like, what are we going to do? How, 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 how what, what's, what's, what you do? What are the, you know, what are the training? How do you conduct household? How you do the praise and worship? So we have to do a Zoom meeting. We contacted our diaspora coordinator, Alberto Morales, a diacono in Ecuador. And we have a Zoom meeting with Brother Ed, you know, and the pastors. And during that meeting, we have three pastors who attended the Zoom meeting, one from Utah, the second, the two pastors from the local, and they said, we want to do CLS. Now we're scheduled to do CLS July 31st, so we're building local team, local Hispanics to be the speakers. And then uh, another one, CLS and LCS in Utah, October 9th. And then another CLS, uh, in in another church so all this cls was scheduled in during the zoom meeting because you know why because we cannot speak spanish right we cannot explain what we're doing it was the spanish spanish brethren that we served before that were witnessing for the beauty of this community so we were surprised they were crying they said, no, these Filipino brethren, they're so humble. They serve hard. They supported us to do all this mission work. So now all these pastors, they said, we want this community. We want this ministry in our parish. So we praise and thank God uh, for this beautiful opportunity that it is true. Uh, we will have sufferings, pain and sorrow. We will experience losses. But God is great. God is good. Because along the way, you know, he will strengthen us. And we will become light of the world. And we will proclaim his honor and glory to the ends of the uh, praise. Amen. Thank you. Rick, for painting a great picture of the life of St. Paul. And for your touching sharing. Brothers, it's time to be awake. <laughs> I can see some of you are start to, and some of you are standing on the back. We got plenty of seats here. It's just like when we do CLS. All the seats at the back are full, but not in the front. But okay. Brothers, now it's, the, it's a good for us to reflect on our service to God. Amen? Amen. And our community. What is my purpose? Where is my focus? Who am I trying to please? Am I true to my calling? These are very simple questions, right? And very easy to answer if you really talk in your heart. This is such a great reminder for us to refocus and change gear if we are treading the wrong path. In the last segment, we learn about the different ways we could misunderstand God's design. In the upcoming segment, we, we will be reminded on how we could prevent from failing into the worldly aspect of our service. To give us the next segment titled Sanctifying Grace of St. Paul, Sinking in the Mire is Brother Ben Waga. Good morning once again. Morning. Much of what I am going to talk about is lifted from 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. 
These two epistles were written by the Apostle Paul. The past talks, we have always been mentioning St. Paul. 2 Corinthians carries a magnificent message about how Christ's power is brought to his people in their weakness and not in human power. It also illustrates the relationship between suffering and the human spirit. The book is full of Paul's personal comments as he reveals the persecutions and difficulties he underwent for the sake of Jesus Christ right from the very start of this conference the first talk centered on Saint but there is another dimension of what Saint Paul has brought about and that is the mysterious thorn in the flesh thorn in the flesh a thorn in the flesh can also be interpreted as a sickness or a physical disability a temptation or a handicap however given Paul's testimony we are made to understand that in the face of all the challenges we will prevail because it's not our power that sustains but God's power but God's strength that dominates in all situations God's is enough In the second book, Corinthians 4, from 7, uh, 7 to 11 verses, it says that we might be ridiculed, humiliated, struck down or in health, but God does not abandon us. In our suffering, we are united in the death of Jesus. And by embracing our crosses, we are following Jesus and manifesting his life. My grace is sufficient for you. The power the, the, is made perfect in weakness. It is in this context about the thorn in the body or in the flesh that I would like to share a little experience that I have had. Sometime in 19, no, in 2015, our servant, a country servant went to New Jersey. I was then a chapter servant. And he went there to use a new program that CFC FFL then was trying to carry throughout the world starting now in starting at that in New Jersey for America it was the live Christ she Christ program the methodology of that evangelization program is what we call life in Christ seminar or the LCS. At first glance, right away, it caught my attention and somehow it struck me as if this is the actual answer where we can truly have a rapid, massive evangelization, which was the outcry then as far as CFC FFL is concerned, if you would remember. Amen? Amen? So right away, I started out a campaign. I called some of our chapter members to join me. As a matter of fact, some of them are here 
now as part of that group. We started calling on parishes, calling on groups of uh, lay people who are interested in developing their uh, religious uh, relationship with God. And we were able to successfully introduce LCS in so many parishes. But then the thorn in the flesh took place in me. I contracted this, what do you call spinal stenosis. Many of you who are in the healthcare may be familiar what that is. It is uh, the narrowing of the channels in the spine that puts pressure on the nerve or the spinal cord and it produces that serious extensive pain in you. There are different kinds of stenosis. There is the cervical stenosis that affects a higher part of your spine, the neck, and the second one is lumbar stenosis, which is the lower part of the body. I had the cervical stenosis in me, and it was something that I never expected to have. But the experience that I have had really was very debilitating. The pain that I was suffering was so intense that I was taking painkillers by the handful already. I take Percocets before I two, three tablets and it put me to a sleep. Two, three hours later, I am awakened by the sheer pain that I am experiencing on my The campaign that we have had on LCS, on so many parishes, begin, began to be affected. But then I prayed and prayed that perhaps God, after me doing some of his work, in evangelization would have mercy on me and heal me from this so debilitating pain that I'm experiencing. But it seems that the response has been withheld. I remember when God, when uh, Saint Paul was asking for him, for God to help him out take all these uh, thorns from him God withheld his help and the response of God was my grace is enough my grace is enough from that alone Paul discovered that in his weakness in his humanity he may be weak but then if God is with him then he is strong by God's grace I was able to endure the pain and continued on with our evangelization campaign in New Jersey there had been at least 30 parishes that embrace the LCS during the first year that we have introduced it there. But then, my doctor said, we cannot continue on you taking opioids, painkillers every day. We need to open you up. You have to undergo surgery and we will try to do something about that stenosis that you have in your 
cervix in your cervical discs 3 4 and 5 so i underwent surgery they put two metal braces on my two metal braces that they screwed three screws for each metal brace the result was dramatic right after the surgery and the wound has healed I have not felt any pain anymore. Then, yeah, but then my lower back started to act up. <laughs> lumbar, lumbar spinal stenosis. And my doctor said, well, you will always, people experience that special and they are past 50 years old. Brothers and sisters, I may not look it. I'm 70 years old. Thank you. But then, the pain once again came back and it was really excruciating. Four days before I came here for this conference, I had to take six steroid injections just for me to be able to re relieve myself of the pain from my lower back. I always think about disease, about temptations, about uh, uh, disabilities as a kind of uh, thorn in the flesh anything that comes your way that makes you uh, or enables and makes you unable to pursue your pastoral uh, uh, objectives is a thorn in the in the flesh but then i also believe that God will never abandon us. He will never abandon us. And uh, despite of all these challenges, we will prevail because it is not the power, our power that sustains. As I said earlier, God strength and power in all situations. Brothers and sisters, in many occasions, when we have this suffering, have you ever come to think that that kind of a suffering comes, may come from God because he wants you to elevate into something that is higher and better? Suffering, perhaps, is something, something that we should be thankful about simply because it is an opportunity for us, an opportunity to, for us to meet that challenge, carry our cross, walk side by side with our Lord Jesus through Calvary, offer our suffering to be in union with Christ so that we may become drawn drawn closer to him. All the victories that we have had, getting parishes to embrace Live Christ, Share Christ program, all the success, in each one of them, we see the mighty hand of God doing it. In many instances, Paul made mention that be aware that all these successes, these victories, comes with a warning. Because many of us, when we have experienced something like that, we become a little bit uh, conceited. 
about these successes. Remember, these are not our successes. These are made God-made successes. Remember TGBTG? To God be the glory. It is His. And everything that comes to us, an experience of suffering, you brand it as a uh, uh, redeeming suffering, re redemptive suffering. It is about Him. It is about God and it is not about us. The example of Paul, to continue, his work despite opposition illustrates his commitment to this way of life among God's people. Essentially, Paul's life challenges us to see life through the paradox of the cross. Through the cross, we are united in Christ and are sanctified in the process. We receive graces from Christ to hurdle the thorns in the flesh that we encounter in life. Because of the cross and God's spirit, we are able to live transformed lives. We know that God asks us to pick up our crosses come follow him. This is a stark difference of the gospel of prosperity that is preached by other groups. For us Christians, all that we do here on earth is a preparation for the third form of sanctification when we finally meet face to face our own mortality when we and go to heaven to experience the ultimate sanctification in union with our God. Amen? Amen. May God be praised. Thank you, Brother Ben, for your touching sharing. Sometimes the Lord allow us to undergo suffering to remind us of our dependence on Him or to teach us or to prepare us for things to come. For when we are in pain and helpless, do we come on bended knees and surrender everything to the Lord. Brothers, if you have come to the conclusion that being sanctified is extremely hard, you are exactly right. It is their hope. Is their hope from all this suffering and persecution? Is there a silver lining? Of course. The answer is Jesus. Amen? Amen? Let us hear Brother Barber delve more into this topic in our final segment. Thank you so much, Brother Tim. So uh, the title of my uh, segment is, uh, if you can show the slides, is uh, Saved by Jesus. Uh, we're supposed to end at 10 o'clock. It's 1026, so... That's my message, saved by Jesus. Back to you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so as you've heard all the challenges and the difficulties and the pains and the sufferings and the death, guess what, brothers and sisters? With all this, we are still saved by Jesus. So how? First is, our struggles are God's ways of bringing out the best in us. Amen? Amen? We go to the gym, right? Some of the brothers go to the gym like me, right? <laughs> you know how we struggle sometimes when we wake up, do we have to go to the gym or no? Or we have to attend a meeting, a rally, it's so early. 
and we struggle in it, right? But the moment we break through that struggle and we went there and we did it, there's just a tremendous joy. Are you with me? Right? The same thing also when uh, we struggle on our temptations and other uh, things that we should not do, right? Our uh, sinful acts before. But we sometimes we're still challenged and, and we, we tend to do some time some of the things but the the thing there is when we were able to hold on to the temptations right and then whatever it is you know uh, that, that we we do but when we're to break through that struggle and not able to do that again the sense of satisfaction follows thank you so much lord i wasn't able to do it but the struggle really uh, that we have as uh, servants is is of course our work no in our journey in life especially in in pity when we serve God, then definitely, as mentioned earlier, uh, the, the stories and testimonials about, you know, uh, the things, the, the hard uh, reality that we face as servants. No? We get oppressed left and right. But brothers and sisters, this is actually, again, uh, a blessing in the Lord in the sense that we are molded. No? We are formed. We are, we are pruned. No? Uh, so many unwanted parts of our system, of our nature, has to be removed. In fact, just like gold, we are tested by fire. Are you with me? To, to take out those impurities. No? In fact, there's a, a verse here I like to, to read. In 1 Peter uh, 1 verse 7, it says there, Even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire. And so is your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. So all these sufferings that we are experiencing, brothers and sisters, just like what Ben has mentioned, these are all redeeming uh, uh, suffering, what he called redemptive suffering. Now, Brother Frank always uh, mentions this, and it allows us to have that process of sanctification, to be sanctified, you know, to be holy. And uh, to be like saints. So, uh, again, in that way, we are being saved by the Lord. The second one is... Um, God... Uh, what do you call this? Hmm. Okay, this the story of uh, Stephen... Uh, so as mentioned by Brother Boots earlier, you know, one of the, the, the uh, early Christians leaders, he was really uh, one of the strongest believers in the young church. He demonstrated wonders and miracles among the people. He was full of wisdom and filled with the Holy Spirit. No? But he was sabotaged. So uh, again, actually the, the slide here is about being sabotaged by the enemy. No, we are being attacked by the enemy. And to be sabotaged is to be viciously attacked, no? to be manipulated by the enemy. And uh, brothers and sisters, that is so true. In fact, I like uh, Brother Frank. Uh, after, if you have heard his uh, uh, podcast last week, when he was asked, okay, Brother Frank, you have already 40 years in MFC. What's next? What's going to happen in the next 10 years? What's going to happen in the next 40 years or so? And then uh, I love it when Brother Frank said, oh, it's going to be a war. And uh, uh, in fact, he has a book there outside. I think it's entitled uh, A Holy War. So, uh, brothers and sisters, when we are sabotaged, you know, it uncovers uh, uh, a certain uh, strength in us. You know? In fact, we experienced this so much uh, in the pandemic during uh, you know, our evangelization has been obviously... Uh, disrupted, but it uncovered some innovativeness in us. We were able to still do our work through the uh, Zoom and the virtual meetings. In fact, uh, sometimes it even made us even better because we were able to connect easier and, and uh, you know, uh, comforts and confines of our home. But what's best is that before when we do our service in the, in the LCSE or, or, you know, uh, CLS, sometimes we go to, to other people, but I have attended a few, uh, gave a few talks in uh, some of the other uh, zones, virtual uh, uh, 
CLS and LTSC, what happened is that we were able to, to even invite our friends in the, and, and families back home. So again, it, despite the, the, the challenge, you know, the Lord gives us other ways to, to do things. No? So it encouraged that uh, uh, strengthen us. So when a person says no to our invitation, uh, we always know that uh, you know, the Lord has other ways. And again, be our family member, our own. Sometimes, Brother Ed mentioned, you have to even have to start in our own family. You don't have to look far. So there will always be a way. The third one is when we are living short of God's design, God is paving a way for a great conversion. From Paul, the persecutor and murderer of Christians, he became, I mean, from Saul, uh, the persecutor and murder of Christians, he became Paul, the great missionary to the Gentiles. No? So, uh, just like Paul, he experienced a lot of sufferings, no? maybe due to our sickness, no? our family uh, problems, our dark, dark past. Some of us have, you know, because of this, joined the community. So, we were like uh, sheep that have given and gone astray, and we have uh, fallen, on the short, fallen short of God's glory. So again, like us brothers and sisters, our conversion, uh, just like mentioned by the speaker last night, Brother Edgar, we are not the holiest of holy, but we were able to uh, convert more because of our uh, experiences in life. And that's why I know most of us here have uh, our own uh, struggles before and have our own story, but these stories of ours have become, uh, you know, uh, things that other people are being inspired on and that's what we are no some of us here are generals of uh the other side before that are now in the side of the lord and that's why when we when we use all these uh experiences that we have in fact god uses us mightily so last one is when we are sinking in the mire god giving us to have a greater trust in him no? Uh, Brother uh, Ben Waga mentioned about uh, Paul's thorn in his flesh. No? How many of us have this type of flesh? I mean, thorn in the flesh as well. No? Uh, Brother uh, Paul, St. Paul had his mishaps, his sufferings. He was shipwrecked. He was imprisoned. He was stoned. He was beaten with a rod. No? And all these things, you know, just like what uh, was mentioned earlier. Paul said, because your gaze is enough, Lord God, my power is made perfect in weakness. So these temptations and challenges and weakness allowed Paul to trust God. As we are being tempted, this results to a greater trust in God, a deeper prayer life, sacramental life, and enter into devotions. So truly, you know, uh, all the challenges that we have, especially in our work, uh, right, even in our families, you know, in our, uh, even in our, own chapter in an own unit in our own uh, household we experience a persecution right are you with me definitely uh, but again no this is what allows us to really give our uh, weaknesses to the Lord so that he will give us our strength so for us brothers and sisters these thorns are blessed moments to embrace the spirit of the risen Christ so whichever you look at it are we being uh, struggles that we have, being sabotaged by the enemy, living short of God's design, and sinking in the mire just like Paul? Jesus is saving us, actually. Amen? Amen. So, with that, I'll give you back, Brother Tim. Thank you. Thank you for the inspiring sharing, Brother Barber. Indeed, Jesus is the, is the answer. Without him, we cannot do anything. There is nothing impossible with God. Let us cling to him and we will be saved. As people of God, our ultimate cling is holiness. We are to love and serve God with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strength, and with all our soul. Persecution and oppression come with our desire to become holy. God does this through tests and trials. 
the testing of your faith produces perseverance. In James chapter 1, verse 3, this is our sanctification. We are being sanctified. As we go through our sanctification, may we gaze upon Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He is the promise himself. When we overcome these trials, our faith becomes stronger, ready to go out to the ends of the, of the earth. I thank my brothers here for their inspiring reflection and generosity in sharing about their personal experience experiences. I pray that all that we have shared today may find a home in your hearts, dear brothers. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, let's give it up for the brothers here at the stage. Hey, these brothers are battle-scarred warriors. What they shared with you are their war stories. And I know you have your own. At this point, we're going to call on Father Pat Garrett. Father Pat will wrap up the session. And he will uh, pray over, give a priestly blessing to our uh, brothers here. But it's said that a little bit strange. The session is done. They're not, their talks are done. What's the pray over for? The pray over for over is for that blessing to flow onto us, the people, the soldiers. Right? So let's pay attention um, to that. So, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I had a husband and wife come in to, uh, to confession. And uh, the wife came in first. When the husband came in, uh, he sat down, he made the sign of the cross, and I said, okay, uh, just make an act of contrition, I'll give you absolution. And, and the guy said, well, wait a minute, don't you want me to confess my sin? And I said, no, your wife's already done that for you. So, so Brian, when she... How much you want to confess? Do you know who she's asking about? You know, so. <laughs> we thank you all for your sharing there. Why don't we stand and now do the summary with the blessings since we're running late here. Lord Jesus, we come to you today and we realize that you, you send us forth as sheep amongst the wolves. You sent your apostles forth. And you've been sending your faithful forth throughout the centuries. We're inspired by your calling of St. Paul and sending him forth, to send him forth through his sufferings, to continue to preach your word. We're inspired by the early martyrs of the church who continue to profess their faith in you, to continue to profess their faith in the Eucharist, even though they were persecuted by the Romans. We know today that you present your struggles to us, you don't give us suffering. Suffering comes from the evil in the world. But you help us to find the blessings in the sufferings. You help us to find the joy in the sufferings. We recognize this through St. Paul, through those early martyrs, through all the faithful that have suffered for your sake throughout the centuries. And we recognize this most importantly in our sufferings. We recognize that those sufferings do indeed make us stronger, that they do indeed allow us to be light to the world, that in our sufferings we can find true joy. We come to you today after a year plus of terrible suffering. We pray particularly for our brothers and sisters who have been, who've suffered from the COVID pandemic. We pray especially for those who have lost their life. Please watch over them. May their souls rest in peace with you. May you comfort those who have lost a loved one here during this pandemic. But we bring to you our stories of suffering because we do recognize that those sufferings are our thorns on our side that do indeed make us stronger. 
Make us recognize your presence. Make us recognize the graces and the blessings that you have given us. We ask you to continue to send your Holy Spirit down upon us, to bless us so that we can endure all of the sufferings of evil that the world brings into our lives, and that we can indeed become stronger, to become true warriors, that through this we can go forth and proclaim the good news to the world. And we ask God to bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I can give you the real five-finger prayer. Everyone, raise your hand. And to God I will say, Lord, I am totally yours. Lord, I am totally yours. Lord, I am totally yours. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sadness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. We say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm blessed with my cross, persecuted, never land. Struck down, but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for as long as we can do. This joy is going to be my strength. Oh, the sorrow of the last of the night Just all the times we are I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. We say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm blessed but not cross persecuted by the battle. Struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. This joy is gonna be my strength. Oh, the sorrow of me for the night, the joy comes with the rain. Yeah. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain, I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. La 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 Please proceed immediately to the gallery of ballroom for the celebration of the Holy Mass. Praise God.